My name is Jerry Gill. Today is September 16th, 2010. I visit Dr. Larry Crosby, Dean of the Spirit School of Business here at Oklahoma State University. And this interview is taking place on the campus in Oklahoma, in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, this interview is for the Old State Stories Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And uh, Larry, thanks for, for taking time for your, your duties as, as Dean to come out and visit with us today. I know you got a lot on your plate. No problem. And, uh, you've had an amazing career. Uh, you know, look back over it first in, in academia and then in the business world, mm -hmm. now back in higher education. And I want to talk about some of those things. Mm -hmm. but could we back up first of all and talk about where you grew up, a little bit about your family life? Right. I grew up uh, born in Detroit and uh, grew up in the Detroit area, in the, you know, for the first few years. Uh, my dad was involved in the uh, auto industry like everybody in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we, uh, my grandfather was, this is kind of an interesting little story, my grandfather was uh, an immigrant from Ireland and my grandmother on my mother's side and he came and uh, he did kind of the jobs that Irish people did, you know, mm -hmm. and, but one of the jobs he had, he was Henry Ford's gardener. Uh, on Henry Ford's uh -huh. estate, and uh, after that he became a policeman and so forth. But uh, just kind of interesting. Um, being Irish, of course, he had wanted to be a policeman, right? Right. But, oh yeah. And stuff. then my my uncle became a fireman. You know, yeah. with the, kind of the typical Irish jobs, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, my dad was a pilot in World War II, uh, POW in Germany, and came back and settled in Detroit. Married my mother and. Um, so I was born in Detroit. Um, you know, it was a great place back then. Um, it's had some challenges since. Uh, I went to high school out more in the middle part of the state, a place called Jackson, Michigan, uh, which is sort of equidistant between Lansing and Ann Arbor. And of course, uh, on a Saturday morning during football season, it's a little bit like maybe Oklahoma City in that every other house has either a Spartan flag or a University of Michigan flag. So I wasn't sure where, where I was going, but I ended up at the University of Michigan. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, basically I was in, I started out in engineering, but changed into general studies, which re really allowed me to define my own undergraduate program. Yeah, I'm gonna pick that up in a minute. Let me ask you right quick. Yeah. Kind of going back, Larry. Yeah. Any brothers or sisters that you had growing up? Yeah, actually, I got two two uh, younger sisters. Mm -hmm. um, one, a uh, couple, couple of interesting stories there. Um, my middle sister, I'm the oldest of the family. My, my middle sister, uh, she worked for uh, uh, Park Davis and then whatever pharmaceutical company <laughs> acquired them. And But uh, at age 50, she went out and started her own business. Um, I set up a clinical evaluations business, which does drug testing for FDA approval. She's making a go of it. My other sister um, was a uh, very uh, talented athlete, and uh, when I was home, you know, during the summer, she was nine years younger than I was. I'd hear a rap on the door, and I'd go out and there'd be all these boys, and they'd say, "Can Elaine come out and play football?" And I thought, <laughs> "Oh, sure, okay, I get this picture." And then they said, no, we want her to be the quarterback. I went, oh, okay. She went, uh, in high school, she played on the, the, the men's uh, tennis team. She went to the University of Michigan and earned a uh, letter in tennis and blew out her knee her sophomore year. That summer, she uh, learned how to play golf. By fall, she made the women's golf team. She went on to be the Michigan amateur. She went on to the, be a tour pro of the LPGA, and she went on to be president of the LPGA. Yeah. You know, she inherited all the athletic genes in the family, I think. Boy, well, speaking of growing up, I mean, did, were you involved in school activities or community activities? Could you share some of those? Sure. I mean, I, I was an Eagle Scout. You know, I was very involved in Scouts. Loved that program. Taught me a lot about the outdoors and how to camp and all other kinds of handy things. Be prepared is the Scout motto. Yeah. And uh, I was also very involved in sports, uh, you know, played football, ran track, and uh, I didn't, I ran track at Michigan as a freshman, but determined I wasn't quite up to their caliber and decided <laughs> I'd focus on studies after that. 
Well, Larry, well, uh, you know, obviously you're very, you're a very entrepreneurial and creative person. It sounds like the rest of your family is as well. Yeah. Well, was there some evidences when you were growing up? I mean, where, where did this come from? You know, I have no idea. Uh, I think uh, my my mother, who was a homemaker, was a very smart woman, is a very smart woman. Both my parents are still alive at 93, and Dad still drives a car. <laughs> Pretty well, actually. Uh, you know, she was a very smart woman. She really pushed us to set goals and to achieve stuff. Dad uh, was a successful business executive. Um, but I would say his forte was, uh, he was very good with people, because you know, he was a marketing and sales executive. And uh, so between the two of them, I think we, we had some good attributes. So I ended up here, and I apologize, you, you enrolled in Michigan. What, what year did you enroll? In I started at Michigan in 1967. And, and you mentioned that, uh, I think you, you received your bachelor's degree in general studies with an emphasis in psychology. Yeah, it's psychology. I took a lot of social sciences, uh -huh. statistics, Psychology, political science, history. That's an interesting, you know, uh, major for for your career pathway. Yeah. What it took. Can, can you talk about that a little? Why you wanted to go that way, and, and right. how, it, how it influenced you, you know, in business later? You know, I was. I really, after I decided engineering really wasn't. It was one of those classic things. I think every every young man back in the '60s. I think dad expected him to get an engineering degree and an MBA, you know, and I, uh, so I, I came on board with that idea but realized that really wasn't my calling at that time. So, um, I, you know, I, I thought that, you know, you got that one time in your life as an undergraduate to really um, broaden yourself and, uh, you know, explore a lot of di different disciplines because you don't know what life's going to throw you or what you need to know when you're you know, at that age. So I, I decided to take advantage of that, and that's why I, uh, you know, kind of studied fairly broadly in the liberal arts. Yeah. Well, can you uh, share some highlights of your graduate education, some of your scholarly activities? That you, I know you bounced a little bit between work after you graduated and, right. and graduate studies. Could you mm -hmm. kind of talk a little bit about that period in your career? Yeah, when I graduated from college, bachelor's degree in 1971, I had no idea, because Mm -hmm. I obviously wasn't preparing myself for any particular occupation, what I was going to do. And I was fortunate to get a job in the marketing research industry, which did tap my psychology and survey research knowledge. I worked for them for four years, and it was a great experience. I'd say it was pretty much the equivalent of a graduate education right there. Uh, we did the marketing research and the uh, marketing planning for mm -hmm. Buick Motor Division of General Motors. And I got at a very young age an opportunity to present to the general manager of uh, Buick and, and some other high executives from General Motors. So it was a really great experience. I was basically trained uh, by the same guy who had trained uh, J.D. Power. If I know if you know the Power ratings, you know, the J.D. Power Awards. So this fellow trained Dave, and then he trained me, and it was a great graduate education. But um, around uh, 1974, the uh, Arab oil embargo, you know, the auto business wasn't so good, and we were laying off a lot of people, and I decided it was a good time to put my uh, career on ice and get advance my education. So that took me to the University of Michigan, where I. Uh, actually, I enrolled directly into the Ph.D. program, and they granted an MBA on the way. So, but I went in with the full intention of having a Ph.D. So, when you went back in after your four years uh, in, 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 yeah. in real real world, right? Uh, did you know at the time that you wanted to be in business? Yeah. So, and I enrolled into the doctoral program in marketing, mm -hmm. you know, which was kind of a followed through on mm -hmm. what I was doing, uh, and uh, I found that what I had learned in practice. Uh, served me pretty good in the uh, PhD program. There was obviously some tool areas that I knew nothing about, but and I knew nothing about accounting or finance, uh, and struggled, got through those okay. Uh, but what I did know about human behavior and human resources and marketing and strategy, I was really able to use a lot of that in my uh, graduate education. So I was very happy I took the time out to get some work experience before going back to graduate school. 
And who's the individual that, that uh, sort of trained you? And, and Our guy's you? name is uh, Dick Johnson. Dick Johnson. He had C.R. Johnson at 35 years old. He had been the general sales manager of Lincoln Mercury. I mean, the guy was just a superstar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, were there other, some professors or other individuals in your career that influenced you in your, your development? Yes, there are, and uh, unfortunately, as you know, you, you get to be 61 years old, remembering their exact names are a little bit uh, hard. Uh, but I can I can describe a, a, a couple. Um, uh, one professor, I think, uh, was a when I was a sophomore studying attitudes and social behavior, psychology department. Um, he had this. Um, idea that you would write into a journal every morning and uh, about your know, thoughts about attitudes and social behavior. So his, he, what he said was, he says, well, find in your dorm room or apartment, find a nice corner uh, where there's a little bit of sunlight comes in, you bring your cup of coffee, pick a time, early 8.30, whatever in the morning, which is early for a student. And, uh, but he, he also said, I want you to compose directly onto the typewriter. I don't want you to take out a legal pad and write it and then transcribe it. He says, I want you to compose right onto the typewriter. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a great experience because first of all, I think that really taught me how to write. And uh, mm -hmm. second of all, that was a great, that keyboarding skill came in pretty handy when the, with the advent of computers <laughs> that I could go, you know, didn't need to go right to the computer. That was a, a good experience. Um, you know, some other professors that I, I, I remember, um, uh, you know, history professor um, who had been, uh, he, was, he was pretty near retirement. He came from Bavaria. He had uh, grown up in southern Germany. And uh, just, I took like four courses from him. I just loved to sit there and just listen to his stories about what it was like, particularly to grow up in Germany at that time and about sword fights and duels that the students would have, and it was just fascinating. Um, and then I had a, a course by a sociology professor um, that dealt with uh, organizations, and um, so, you know, kind of the theory of organizations I was very impressed by, mm -hmm. by that. It was a graduate, my one graduate course that I took as an undergraduate. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, you and was it 83 when you got your, your PhD from Michigan? Actually, I got it earlier than that. I got it in 1979. In 79, okay. Yeah. Then you uh, accepted a position at Arizona State University. No, I, I started out at uh, another Big 12. Wasn't I don't know if it was the Big 12 there. I started out at University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Okay, I knew there's a gap in there somewhere. Okay. Yeah. I started there uh, teaching in 79. Mm -hmm. ABD finished my dissertation, and you know, right off the bat, pretty much, um, big red country. Um, you know, uh, it was a great experience uh, picking that school. I, I, it was a very good time to be graduating with a doctorate because there was tons of jobs, mm -hmm. and uh, we all had lots of offers. And uh, I did the, uh, you know, kind of the rational thing of. Uh, taking with my wife at the time, we took out a piece of paper, we built a matrix mm -hmm. and said, okay, here's the evaluative criteria and here's the universities where I have a job offer. We rated each one of them on a criteria, we weighted the criteria, we added it up, indexed it up, rank ordered them. The University of Nebraska came out last. And I looked at that and I said, I think this tells me I need to go to the University of Nebraska. <laughs> and that was a great decision, and uh, really, I don't think I could have advanced my career any faster than having gone there. And, but I learned something from that, and it's something that I've learned uh, and carried forward into everything I've been doing. That you know, you need to deal with people from both. You got to win both their minds and their hearts, mm -hmm. and uh, the emotional factor in decision making is absolutely critical. And what that exercise and the fact that I ended up choosing Nebraska says is that in the end, you know, the decision is really an emotional decision. And, uh, you know, so I, as I've explored things like branding and, and so forth, I've always kept that 
that experience in the back of my mind. The big red experience always, yeah. always there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Then was it at that point then that you, when you left uh, Nebraska, did you go to? to went Arizona back to State? Michigan. Went back to Michigan as a visitor for a year. I replaced mm -hmm. a professor who was a, gone to be a visitor at Harvard, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was kind of like musical chairs. I went back for a year and taught uh, in Michigan's MBA program, of which I was a graduate. And uh, I also taught in their exec ed programs. And that was a great experience, good year. Um, then I went to uh, Arizona State as an associate professor and uh, was there for well, a total period, I guess, from when I signed up until I resigned, it was about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences there, you know, the areas of emphasis, which you were teaching, right. researching there? Right. Um, primarily uh, teaching consumer behavior, marketing research, marketing strategy. I um, was very involved in the doctoral program and, uh, you know, taught the methods course for the Ph.D. students. And um, I, um, it was a good experience, you know, I worked my way up the academic totem pole, you know, tenure, full professor. Um, I, uh, w I probably one of the coolest experiences I had there was um, I was involved with the inception of a center focused on services, marketing, and management. Um, about that time, kind of the world, particularly people in the United States, woke up to the fact that most people in the U.S do not work in manufacturing jobs. They work in services. Mm -hmm. And even then, this is a circa early 80s, 70% um, of the workforce was already employed in services. But if you looked at what academia was studying, it was all about manufacturing. You know, accounting, finance, marketing, production, it was all about making things. Mm -hmm. But we had this huge service economy. So we decided to launch a, a center focused on services, marketing, and management, and it and it exists today, and it's you know 25 or so years old. And I was uh, the founding research director, and um, we started off with a uh, a nice grant from a regional bank, a million dollar grant, and or endowment, I should say and uh, built that into quite a powerhouse. It's now considered the, the top center on services in the world. And uh, I'm still on the board over there. I guess that's source of pride for you. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, really uh, one of the most important academic things I had done up until coming here to right. Oklahoma State. Sure. <laughs> well, so you, I mean, you, I'm trying to get the picture. You're a full professor, you know, you're tenured, you're right. heading up research in this, this, right. this great center. Yeah. Then you decided to go into a, a private industry. Yeah, I did. Can you, can you kind of talk about how you, how you made the decision, why you did that? Well, I mean, people thought I'd totally lost my marbles, you know. <laughs> uh, why do you, why would you give up tenure, you know? And uh, I really wasn't that worried about it. I mean, I figured, well, you know, if I got tenure here, maybe I, if I need to come back, I can get tenure over there. So I thought that wasn't really all that risky. But um, it was during a sabbatical that I got hooked up with this um, uh, marketing research company out of Indianapolis called uh, Walker Information. And they were really, um, they were working on a topic that was near and dear to my heart. This was the customer satisfaction topic. And they wanted to be, you know, the kind of leader in the measurement of customer satisfaction. So I wrote for them something called the formula, which, yeah, sort of like Coke has its formula. <laughs> so that sabbatical year, I wrote the formula, and um, you know, it it pretty much defined how to do customer satisfaction research for that company um, and its clients, and they were big clients, IBM and people like that. Um, so I was approaching the end of that sabbatical and uh, they gave me a proposition. They said, we'd like to take this international. We're not an international company, we're a domestic company. We'd like to be international. We'd like to use customer satisfaction as a way of creating an international presence. So we created something called CSM Worldwide, which was a, uh, uh, not really a subsidiary, it was a separate company they owned two-thirds of it and I owned a third. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, went out and flew around the world 
visiting other marketing research companies and recruited them into a network. And uh, wow. I used uh, I used a, a, a type of organization that was a little uh, unique. I used franchising. Uh, I know we're all, you're all familiar with like McDonald's or Wendy's or whatever. So I think the idea was that we use franchising to create this network and they would be franchisees. And that's what we did and we set it up and it really worked well. I was able to bring in some very big marketing research companies that were willing to be a franchisee and to use the formula to deliver customer satisfaction measurement around the world. And uh, so in kicking that off, I thought, hmm, this is a, you know, it's a little bit more interest me, interesting to me right now than being in academia. Mm -hmm. And so I asked uh, Arizona State to give me a leave. Then they gave me another leave. Then they gave me another leave. Finally, I went to the dean, dean and I said, I, I got to stop. I can't to do, the, do this to you. I know you got to fill the line, so I'll resign. And, uh, you know. So that's what I did, and then I continued to do the CSM worldwide for about four years, and we grew that from about zero, well, zero revenue to that unit to about $25 million operation. And um, at that point I decided, um, hmm, maybe I can do this on my own. <laughs> so uh, my sister, the golfer, and I each put up a whopping sum of $13,000 each to fund the creation of a company that came to be known as Symmetrics. And uh, so then over the course of the next 10 years, we took that from zero to about $15 million uh, and uh, sold it in 2004 to Cinovate. And Cinovate is... A little more than 26000 Yes, we got a little bit more back than that. <laughs> uh, we were bought by Cinovate. Cinovate is one of the largest marketing research companies in the world. It's like a top ten. They're everywhere, like in 70 countries. And they used uh, my company to launch a global practice in customer experience management. So I ran that global practice. Could, could you explain that term just a little bit, Larry? Mm -hmm. Against yeah. customer service. It's uh, it, it's kind of a it follows from these other topics that I've been working on. You know, there was we started off with customer satisfaction, then we had uh, service quality, mm -hmm. we had c customer perceived value, and we had customer loyalty. Customer experience management is kind of the the uh, stepchild of all of that, and it has to do with uh, creating relevant and memorable experiences for customers on a consistent basis. It's about, very much about how you define the brand. And uh, so that was the focus of this practice. So I spent the next four years flying around the world, uh, visiting all of our, uh, our uh, units in the various countries, training them up on how to do customer experience measurement and management. And I, at some point, I think I knew every rivet in the interior cabin of a 747. <laughs> but uh, with 70 uh, business units, I probably visited, you know, 85 percent of those business units, and many of them more than once. <laughs> you get a lot of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, join the Navy, see the world. <laughs> yeah. So now you then, at what point did you you step down? Well, it was kind of a transition process as I, last year, um, began to sense that I probably, again, accomplished, you know, most of what I could accomplish at Cinovate and began thinking about, okay, what was going to be the, uh, the final, uh, you know, dance here. And uh, I always knew that I'd come back to academia at some point. And I, I just didn't know what, in what capacity. And um, so I began to talk to some of my academic friends, and uh, I said, well, I'm thinking about going back into academia, maybe just be a professor and do consulting on the side, write a few papers. And they said, well, you know, you really, you're, you've got more uh, potential than that. You should be a dean, because you can combine your academic experience and business experience. And I went, me? A dean? 
Well, I thought about it for a while and decided to apply for a few deanships. And uh, you know, I was in the running for a few. And um, but I, I'll tell you, I had the my first conversation with Gary Trenopal. Uh, was heading up the steering committee for the uh, dean search for Oklahoma State. I mean, I knew at the I knew before that conversation was over, I knew I was going to end up here. I don't know, just uh, had that kind of feeling in the gut. This was where I was going. <laughs> Let me back on that because I want to I kind of uh, bootleg a little bit. Uh, I'm trying to get the picture. So you're you're living in you right, Colorado at this time. That's right? true. That's true. You got a beautiful home in the Rockies. Right. Finance is secure. Yeah. And why? <laughs> <laughs> You sort of explained it. I still don't know why yeah. you come back in academia, but but what? But you sort of answered that question. But moving to the next one, why is it you felt the way about Oklahoma State? Mitch? What what appealed to you about this position? Well, I think there was um, a number of things. One is uh, comprehensive land grant institution. You know, it's a big operation with a big mission. Mm -hmm. So I found that interesting. And uh, uh, I, you know, having been in Lincoln, Nebraska, I, I, don't, I don't say that I'm not equating Lincoln and Stillwater, but there's something about the value system, the ethic, and the type of people that live in this part of the country that I really enjoy. Um, I also uh, was, as I got to farther into the interviewing process, I was very impressed by the. Uh, uh, vision that I was hearing from uh, President Burns Hargis. Uh, create, innovate, educate, just really resonated with me and the kind of background I had had. And as I got to understand Burns and the fact that he himself was not an academic, uh, but somebody who very much appreciates academics, suggested to me we could really maybe do some great things here. Of uh, breaking the mold, and uh, and then as I again as I you know did went through the interviewing process and met the faculty and other deans, um, I became uh, convinced that yeah I had you know made the the, the right assessment that these were good people and that uh, uh, this was a good place for me and and fortunately they offered me a job which I quickly accepted. Well, picking up your comments, how important was. Uh Burns Hargis in your decision to accept the position of I'd say it was, you know, it's hard to know how you put weight on various factors, but, you know, I would say a very important decision. Um, not, not just Burns, who was very personable and, and uh, you know, very down to earth guy with a great sense of humor, <laughs> which you probably know. Uh, but, you know, not just who he is, but what he stands for, you know, so it was really buying into that vision was a big factor for me. What uh, you get a sense that, that in the past, and you and I mentioned this off off camera earlier, that, right. that Oklahoma State has been blessed with some pretty strong leadership in the, in yes. the former College of Business Administration, Oklahoma right. State, now right. Spears School of yep. Business. Yep. Uh, this this had some some state and and, and regionally acclaimed programs, mm -hmm. fairly strong. Mm -hmm. But one senses as you hear kind of what's coming out of the, the uh, school. Fair School of Business now that there's some, some fundamental change. Right. Uh, can you talk about some of how, what, what some of the emerging, uh, what will be some of the new directions for the school? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, I, you know, I, I tip my hat to the past. Uh, you know, there's been a, like you say, a, a great legacy here at the university and in the school itself. Um, I think that, you know, a very uh, appealing factor of the university for me is its international roots. Um, you know, uh, the West Watkins Center and uh, uh, Dr. Bennett and uh, the whole story of, you know, the Four Points program. And you have to remember that I'm, I spent the last eight years in international business. So here's another point where we jive pretty good. I, w that, I was surprised, actually, to learn about that legacy. I didn't know it was so strong. I mean, who would think, you know? You could think that a university with big international tentacles would be on the East Coast or West Coast, mm -hmm. right here in the middle of the United States. 
amazing story. It is an amazing story. And uh, so I, I know, you know, I think that that, again, is an attraction factor for me that, you know, we can build on that legacy. It basically provides momentum. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think I got a big job in front of me, but it's much easier to do when you got momentum behind you. And there's clearly momentum here. Um, and I feel the same way about the Spears School. Uh, you know, that there's, uh, you know, it's a very good school. It's got momentum. Um, you know, it's, it's got a, a great uh, bunch of people. I mean, I, I'm coming in uh, just a, a year and a half after they founded the uh, School of Entrepreneurship and the Riata Center. Uh, which you know very quickly has become the um, uh, probably the most comprehensive program in entrepreneurship in the country. I, I, I don't know that I, I can't think of anybody comes even close, and it's accomplished so much in a year and a half. So there's tremendous momentum there, and a lot of interest in the in the community, uh, the state, uh, nationally, of course, uh, around that topic. So that that's great. But there's a number of points of pride inside the Spear School. But at the same time, I kind of felt that one thing I observed is, and this is maybe part of the values of being in Oklahoma, we don't toot our horn very good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of that, part of that, was va that value system is a certain degree of humility, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I find, I like humility. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to turn up the volume a little bit. <laughs> and uh, so one of the things that I quickly noticed was there are a number of points of pride in, in the Spears School, entrepreneurship just being one, uh, on which we need to put a more bright spotlight, uh, not just within the state of Oklahoma, but nationally and internationally. So that, but again, that's, that's some, some momentum I can capitalize and leverage. Um, but I think, too, you know, we're kind of poised, really, at Oklahoma State to move to the next level, to, you know, advance our reputation yet a couple more notches. And uh, that's where I think my, my mission is here for, uh, as, as dean, is to, to help make that happen. Larry, I understand that uh, you and your leadership team are currently working on uh, and engaged in some strategic planning. Yeah. Would it be premature? I mean, could you share maybe some uh, priorities and initiatives that are emerging from your planning right. discussions at this point? One of the things I think that you, you know, you need to accomplish. I mean, I, I came up with a bunch of ideas about innovative ideas about what we could do, um, but that's from an outsider's point of view, and um, you know, I can't teach the courses. You know, I can't. You know, I mean, I. <laughs> You know, there has to be buy into this. You don't just dictate vision and strategy. With faculty, that's, that's a good Especially idea. with the faculty. Uh, with staff, too. So um, I really want to spend my, a lot of my time right now in a very uh, deliberate way creating a shared vision that uh, uh, touches the value system that we have, uh, that people can buy into, that they find a sense of passion behind that and, and uh, they're willing to put energy to help us achieve those goals. So, you know, where I could have dictated a vision in the first seven days, you know, we're taking a little bit more of a deliberate process to bring in a variety of stakeholders and to help shape this. But um, I can kind of share with you, you know, Jerry, just, uh, you know, kind of a high level. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I don't want to be quoted on this because I got some people who are you know, wordsmith this a lot better than it exists today, but, um, you know, I think the idea of, first of all, ins inspiring and engaging the students, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, is very important, but inspiring and engage engaging them to dream big. Uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, I think our country uh, is in the need of a shot in the arm for a variety of reasons at this point in time. We need some big dreamers that have some uh, tall mountains they want to scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we encourage, inspire, and engage them to dream big, to stretch their leadership potential. I mean, that's one of the, the key things that we want them to 
take out of their spirit school experiences to advance that leadership capability by a variety of ways. Um, some of those ways are um, through, you know, the collaborative type of education uh, that we need to have, that we do have, but can, 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 can uh, make more prominent in the school, which gives students opportunities working in teams and groups to sort of exercise their leadership wings. You know, in a case where they have no authority, they have no money, uh, to actually get other people to do things. That's leadership in my mind. So the only way you really become a leader is by trying stuff and seeing what happens and going home at night and say, shoot, that just didn't work. I gotta try a different tact. And then you go back and try something else. That's a, those are leadership growth opportunities. And um, also through student associations, uh, through work that they do in the community or in the international community, working with not-for-profits, give them as much leadership uh, exposure opportunities as possible so that they can, uh, you know, cultivate that, those skills. And a lot of that is, there's book learning there, but it's a lot of doing, too, that needs to happen. So that's one of uh, kind of the vision part is that leadership development. We also want people that are capable, and this is where we kind of begin the really kind of stretch goals, uh, people who are capable of transforming organizations. That, um, you know, it's not, not just about incremental change, but about major reinvention kind of, kind of change. And uh, uh, that, you know, they have the the tools and skills and mindset that can bring that about in organizations and communities and in society. And uh, with a net result that, you know, they can make a difference in the world. Now, I know those sound like high, but again, it's all about momentum. And uh, I'm just, uh, you know, pleased with the interactions I'm having with the incoming freshmen. Um, I've been out there talking to them at some of the orientations and various social functions and just kind of trying to find out where the 19-year-old mind is today. And I'm really impressed. Um, the kids are coming today with a different mindset. Um, I think that the, the mindset that existed in the 80s was I'm going to get that education, I'm going to get that degree in accounting or investment finance, and I'm going to go to Wall Street, I'm going to be an investment banker, and by the time I'm 25, I'm going to have a BMW and a condo in Florida. <coughs> um, these kids aren't like that. The ones that are coming in today, they have, yeah, they want to be, they want the expertise of a profession, you know, they want to, they want to know their stuff. That's one of the reasons they're coming to school. But they have a much higher uh, social motive than, than their predecessors. I mean, they want to make a difference in the community. They want to make a difference in the world. They want to tackle things like sustainability, tackle things like childhood obesity, the big kind of wicked problems that face the world. Well, we'd be idiots if we didn't capitalize on that energy and channel it. And so when I when we put these words down into our vision that we want to cultivate a capability to do transformational change, we're, it's to a high degree about channeling that energy. Yeah. So you mentioned your areas of emphasis and your vision on students. Are yeah. there other vision areas that you have for the college? Well, one of the big things, and uh, you know, Hopefully, when you play this back five years from now, we can see how well I did, is to try to get ourselves a new building. Um, the uh, facility that we're in uh, is not doing the job uh, what's required in modern management education. It's essentially a, an office building. Um, and an office building that uh, is not conducive to collaboration by any stretch of the imagination. It, it was built in the 1960s. Um, you know, they taught business different than that. 
different then than they do today. Um, <clears throat> we need areas where uh, students can team up, collaborative spaces where they can do their group projects, mini conference rooms where they can uh, assemble and do mock presentations. Uh, we need uh, places where they can just hang out and talk about business. We need uh, spaces that will uh, attract people from elsewhere on the campus because um, you know I think we're we're also about interdisciplinary efforts in the Spears School and in and, and linking up with other assets and resources that exist here on campus. We also need to create a place I think that has a, a greater sense of activity. Uh, you know I would I would like in our current building not so much the first floor although it's got some limitations but all the other floors too pretty much the Los Angeles morgue <laughs> and it doesn't you know it doesn't it doesn't exude that type of energy that I think that a, a, a modern business school needs to exude you know you need I think a business school needs to be more like a hive of activity more like a beehive where you can see work getting done. You can see people presenting to each other, talking to each other, collaborating, putting post-it notes on the walls and the windows, and and you know, and even arguing now and then about you know tax laws or whatever they argue about. But I mean, you, you know, it just doesn't have that sense of hive, and uh, that's I think uh, part of my dream for this new school. And uh, so we've got. Um, a team of architects that we've uh, been able to hire. Chuck Watson, who uh, funded our um, trading floor, uh, also has provided us with some early building seed money. It won't build a building, but it'll help us plan to build a building. And so with that money, we've been able to hire an architect team. Um, and they are uh, doing the sort of phase one programming and we hope to come out by December with, you know, pretty much a clear idea where we need to go. And then, and then again, and then bring in additional stakeholders to get their buy-in and agreement on this. Um, my personal goal, I'd like to see us in a new building by the end of 2015, which, you know, is possible. So, yeah, that, that's a goal, at least. Do you, Larry, do you, do you plan in the near future then to be spending a lot of time in fundraising? Yeah, I'm, I, I came in and I told the faculty and the steering committee that, you know, I will be more of an external dean than maybe has existed in, you know, recent past. Um, I think I've got really good leadership underneath me and, and two uh, very good associate deans of Robert Dooley and Mark Weiser, not to mention Lisa Fain and uh, Julie Weathers and others who are in more staff leadership roles. Um, I'm not too worried. I mean, there are policy things I need to weigh in on, but you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, they they know more about these operations than I do, uh, which makes it possible for me to spend more time in development. Um, one of the things I did was um, I have an office in the Tulsa campus, and I think I may be the first dean to do that. And so I have an office here and an office there, and my, my uh, objective is to try to spend at least a day a week in the Tulsa office, which, not, isn't, which will, of course, put me in contact with the faculty there, but gives me the ability to interact with the Tulsa business community very easily, right, go over for coffee, lunch, meetings, and so forth, and, or have them over. <laughs> And, uh, and then uh, spend a couple other days a week uh, in development. So potentially Tulsa and two development days, and then the other two days are focused more internally. Well, speaking of that, your fundraising you know, experience, but you, you bring some, some personal strengths and experiences mm -hmm. from, your, you know, from the private sector right. side. Uh, how, how will these impact you, or how important will they be to you in your role as dean? Well, I think they, they should, you know, on the, talking to the development side of the equation, um, you know, one of my big jobs in the industry, particularly when you're the 
president or a CEO of a company, you are the main business development person. You know, you're regardless of what you think that job is, it's business development. So I've had a lot of you know sales experience, and I and I don't equate sales and development exactly, but they're kissing cousins. And um, but one thing that I learned from sales or business development is the idea of uh, need selling. That you know you're you're not selling or pushing products and services. You're trying to understand the customer's needs and adapt your offering to mm -hmm. fulfill their needs. So I think this correlates real well with our um, branding success campaign and the idea of uh, trying to find the donor's passion. What gets their motor running? And you know, to understand, start by listening more, understanding what it is they're trying to accomplish, and then find an opportunity to give that uh, ties into the passion that they have. So I think that'll be, I think I get that. Mm -hmm. And uh, time will tell how, how effective I am. You, you talked about facilities and, and building and is a priority for the, for the school. Right. Are there other, under that branding success campaign, do you have other fundraising priorities for the school? Absolutely. Um, some of them, um, you know, some of them kind of tie to the building. I, I think that there are certain um, uh, initiatives that we will be rolling out that will have um, a uh, faculty component from a chair and professorship component. They'll have a scholarship component. They'll have a program component and a building component. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the interview, um, one of my great experiences was creating that center at Arizona State University. And uh, I, I learned how important centers are to creating a focus in a business school and, and developing that national, international reputation. Um, so we're going to continue on that road. I mean, we have our Riata Center already, which is on the entrepreneurship topic, but I think we have ability to create some other centers um, that would bring in funds to support faculty, students, programming, and building. Um, one area that I think we're particularly strong at, and we need to create more bench strength around, is this notion of what's been called data mining. But I think we, we have an opportunity to create a first-rate center in business analytics. Uh, I think we've got the momentum we've got, and it's, again, it's the kind of center I like in that it's cross-department, that it fosters cooperation, uh, certainly within the business school and possibly across campus. And let me give you an idea. Um, what this has to do with is the use of very sophisticated software to go into databases and find patterns, find cause and effect relationships in a very exploratory way, big databases. So you can imagine how business might use that today. For example, it might go into a customer database and try to understand, Jerry, what credit card offer to give you it's different than the credit card offer they give to your neighbor because you know that's what the data mining tells them to do and they can optimize the chance that you'll sign up for the credit card. Um, well that same technology can be, uh, and, and we are very good at this, we're doing basic research in it, but we're also teaching it at a very high level and it involves a combination of our marketing department and our management science and information systems department sort of mm -hmm. working two sides of this with big support from SAS which is the big company the software company for a statistical software company um, so I would like to see us get some serious funding for this to really grow this as a center of excellence and um, but it has great uh, cross-campus opportunities I, I understand now that we've been talking to health sciences folks about using these tools to go into medical databases and that you can actually use it for diagno diagnostic purposes. Um, that the, sometimes the software will find a predictor of breast cancer or something that uh, is not quite so predictable, you know, using conventional, you know, the art of 
of medicine, you know. And um, another area, which is kind of a fun area, uh, is uh, just a few years ago, these folks in, that are working in this area came up with a method for predicting the success of movies before they're released by doing data mining and um, looking at things like uh, actor appeal and things like this. And they can predict which are going to be the blockbusters and which are going to be the flops. Are they pretty accurate? They're very accurate. So, uh, and they've got written up a bit in the press about that. And uh, so I was talking to our alumni, Garth Brooks, a little while ago, and I was mentioning this to him. And, and he and I kind of looked at each other and I said, you know, I wonder if that would work in the record business. And uh, so I thought I was real smart that Garth and I had come up with this idea. So I went back and talked to these guys and they said, we've already done it. So this summer, one of the PhD students developed a model to predict the success of hit records. I think, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so there's things like that in the school that uh, we can build on, we can put a spotlight on, we can get additional funds for, create a center, cross, cross business functions, maybe even tying in other parts of the campus. I think it's really exciting stuff. Now, so I have a number of sort of center ideas that uh, can help put us on the map, I think. Well, you, uh, you're certainly recognized internationally I mean, for your experience and expertise in branding and brand management. Yeah. Uh, how would this experience translate to an institution of higher education, uh, generally and specifically? Do you have some thoughts on how you intend to brand the, the school? Right. Well, certainly I think uh, this discussion that we're having about um, the vision mm -hmm. and the values and then the strategies that will help us achieve that vision, um, that's kind of the internal side mm -hmm. of, uh, of what you're talking about. The external side is the branding, is how we take that message out to external publics. And, um, you know, create that brand promise of the what is the Spears experience exactly? Mm -hmm. So regardless of where you touch the Spears School of Business, you know what to expect, and it's something that you desire, and it's consistently delivered across all touch points. And that's been my mantra of working with businesses, big businesses, uh, for a number of years now. So we want to apply it on our own. But we got to, you know, it's really a crafting here because um, I, I saw a statistic the other day that there are something like 900 schools in the United States alone that are granting degrees in business today. So it is a very crowded field, highly fragmented. Now in, in most industries, that fragmentation wouldn't, uh, wouldn't survive. You'd have, you'd have industry consolidation would occur and people would buy other people until it got down to be like 30 or 40. But in higher education, there are various barriers to that consolidation occurring, you know, although I, thought maybe we should buy the University of Texas, but I have to talk, have to, talk to Boone about that. Uh, the, so, you know, we'll continue to be in a highly fragmented world of higher education, but that creates a lot of noise and clutter out there in messaging, and it's very difficult to pick up the noise and pick up the message from the noise that's there. So we have to be very... Um, uh, smart about how we define that brand and how we communicate it uh, in a way that cuts through the fog. And uh, we're, we're going to be able to do that. And I think it's really about picking some critical niches that uh, we can own, where it's, you know, either by being first or best, we own that niche so that when people think X, whether it's business analytics, whether it's entrepreneurship, um, whether it's sustainability, whatever the topic is, when they think, who's the best at this? Or, you know, they think Oklahoma State, they think Spears School. That's how we begin to cut through that, pierce that fog, and having those centers, so you, you know, you have the, mm -hmm. the capability to actually deliver what you promise as part of that equation. I hear that the, the school is looking at offering a PhD program in business administration to aim to business executives. 
Right. What, what, what can you tell me about that? That's, I mean, we're all familiar with the MBA, the executive MBA. Right. Master's of Business Administration. Right. This, this is a little bit different. This is different. That. This is different. Um, currently, you know, we, we offer uh, essentially bachelors. Uh, we have a variety of master's programs. We have the MBA, but we also have master's of science programs in various disciplines. And then we have the doctor PhD program. And all, you know, I think we're quite good in all of those areas. PhD program has 50 to 60 doctoral students in it. Um, many of them go off to uh, good schools, some of those, you know, peer institutions of Oklahoma State. Um, we're basically preparing uh, folks for a career in academia to do what faculty do, teach and do research. And I think we got a little buzz going on there. Yeah, one is, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, but there's another niche for very high advanced study in business, and uh, that is beyond the master's degree and is a terminal degree. And we're euphemist, euphemist, <laughs> we're, our code word for it is executive doctorate until we are absolutely sure what it is. Mm -hmm. Some schools call it a, you know, a PhD, some schools call it a DBA, some schools call it a, a doctorate in management or an executive doctorate. We don't know what, how it's exactly going to be labeled, but it's positioned different. It's positioned for somebody who's probably of a bit of an older age cohort, who has already had significant work experience. They've already achieved success in business or in other organizations. It doesn't just have to be business. Um, you know, where they're at least upper middle management, if not higher. And, um, you know, they. They feel, by virtue of the kind of work that they do, they can profit from having a very advanced degree that would allow them to, um, you know, identify and seize additional opportunities, or having more credibility in the position that they're in, uh, or in some cases, um, having the doctorate degree that would enable them to let's say, become a clinical professor or a professor of practice at a university. Um, so it's very much, um, it's a degree that's very much focused on the practice of business um, and the application of theory more than creating theory. So let me give you an example. There's a good analogy for this. Uh, in chemistry and physics, you know, through the work that our chemistry and physics people do, there's a lot of theory being created about, you know, molecules and materials and planets and so forth. But then there's this, we have this other college called engineering. You know, you've got, let's say, physics and chemistry are, you know, advancing science, the theory of science, but then you have an engineering school which takes all of that and applies it to the real world. So if you want to think about it, that's kind of what this exec doctorate does, is take the theory and apply it to the real world in a, in a very advanced way. Obviously there will be a feedback loop there where what they learn from that can then modify theory. Um, evolve and change maybe. Kind of evolve and change. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very excited about this. Uh, there are very few schools in the United States offering this today. We, we're, not, we're not seeing this um, it's necessarily supplanting our traditional PhD program, but it's got a very different focus and a different track. Um, these executives would, for the most part, still be working, mm -hmm. so it would be run a little bit more like an executive MBA from an operational standpoint, where we'd be using a combination of distance learning and face-to-face, -face, but they would fly into, let's say, Tulsa, and we would have a facility in Tulsa uh, where this was uh, where the education occurred. We, we bring them to campus now and then just so they can get the flavor of you know mm -hmm. academia, but it would be much more uh, urban uh, based uh, in terms of where we actually did the education. Appreciate the explanation. Thank you. With your 
you know, extensive knowledge in the private sector, uh, how will the Spirit School of Business be reaching out to state and regional companies and engaging them in the activities of the school? Right. We do do quite a bit already. Um, I, I think we could do more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for our organizations to get involved with our school. Um, we're fortunate that uh, many of them are volunteering speakers. Uh, we have a CEO day where we bring in CEOs. We're re-engaging with our MBA graduates, and I think that as we do that, you know, we're going to be identifying additional speakers. Uh, we're going to be identifying additional companies that, that we can work with. Um, we have a variety of student projects. Um, you know, uh, some of them are more entrepreneurial. Some of them are more in connection of working with existing businesses. Our marketing research classes get out there and do tons of surveys and research, provide data for, for organizations. Um, I think it's, you know, it's just incumbent upon me as kind of a corollary to my development efforts to make sure that we've, you know, really integrated with the Devons and the Chesapeake's and the Williams and the Conoco's and Exxon and, 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 and smaller organizations here and, and make sure that uh, they understand what the resources we have uh, that they can tap, but also that we understand what resources they have that, that we can use to create more experiential learning opportunities for our students. Larry, right, have you, do I hear you saying that you comment in smaller companies, there's a lot of uh, nationally talk from President's podium, you know, on day right. about the importance of, of the economy, uh, small businesses to the growing the economy, et cetera. Right. Right. Do you have some thoughts about the direction of working with smaller companies? Well, I think that, you know, that really is, I think, the, the strength of our uh, school of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it's, uh, we've also here on campus uh, launched the uh, uh, See, cre creativity and innovate Institute for Creativity and Innovation. So new, I have to I had kind of trouble getting it out. But uh, it's uh, again a cross campus uh, focus. We we've, we've been actually housing it over in the business school, but it'll eventually end up in the union. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, a cross campus effort initiative to uh, really uh, develop the creative capabilities. Uh, on campus, which is kind of the, the first step of any new product or service. It's really where uh, you take two things that, seem, that are seemingly unrelated and you combine them together and you got something new. And that's the creative activity. But you can come up with ideas like that, but they just sit on the table. You need to have a way of, you know, of managing an innovation process and um, you know, finding the capital that'll allow you to you know make that a reality. So you've got innovation, and you've got entrepreneurship, which is really about the implementation phase. So this this all this is all kind of early on stuff, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is small business. But on the other hand, there's um, existing small businesses that kind of know what they're about, are looking how they can grow. And uh, I'm not so sure that they are all quite as clued into the programs that we offer through uh, our CEPD, which is Continuing Ed and Professional Development. So I, I want to make sure, and you know, that we do have a good curriculum there for certificate type of programs. These could be three days a week, you know, maybe longer, where a small business person can, you know get up to speed in some areas that will help them grow an existing small business. Uh, and um, so I'm talking to the, cha the various chambers about this, and tr trying to make sure we've got our continuing ed aligned with the needs of small business. <clears throat> well, how, in what ways will alumni be important to you in the future? You mentioned, we talked about some fundraising other areas, but how important are they going to be the future of the school in your mind? and? And what roles do you see them engaged? Well, I've been trying to, um, a couple things in that regard. One, one is um, I've, you know, had meetings with the uh, head of the, uh, the board, the Alumni Association board for the Spears School. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're all very gung-ho 
uh, and uh, but lacking in a, a clear idea of where they can sort of plug in. So I'm working with them to see how they can plug in. And one area that they're plugging in virtually as we speak is into the uh, that vision reset process so that they will have a, an input into that. Mm -hmm. And uh, can also, re as, as that vision and strategy becomes more and more crystallized, that they can react to that as we're going along. So I want them to be on the ground floor of that activity. Um, there's, you know, the Alumni Association has folks that, you know, have skill sets that we can tap. For example, I don't think we do a great job in social marketing. This would be, you know, social networks and so forth. Well, one of the, one of the fellows on the uh, alumni board, this is what he does for a living. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, being able to tap that and, and get some idea about what we mm -hmm. could be doing that we're not doing would be great. Um, I think the alumni are just kind of setting fundraising aside. I think the alumni are critically important as we attempt to identify and bring into the Spear School the, the best and brightest students that you can have. They're, they're, they're the gorillas out there in the, in the field, you know. They're saying good things and doing good things for Oklahoma State. Yep, and then they got their ear to the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, they know people who are going to the high schools that we should, we should be getting. And out there, uh, uh, you know, talking us up and, and, and getting us in the sights of those students to be considered as where they might, might go to school. Uh, and and I, I see that as kind of an extension of our, our recruiting efforts. The alumni association is a very big uh, role to play. I do think that, um, you know, it, I think this is an area where I'm going to call it the category of alumni relations. Um, I think this is an area where we haven't always done as good a job as we can do. We sort of allow it to just find its own way. And, you know, there are a lot of alumni, as you, as you pointed out, when we're walking up here, we have great, you know, stories. They're, they feel connected. They, you know, people like Bob Ham, Lee Manzer, and, you know, they feel very connected to these folks and, uh, you know, any of the professors in the accounting department. Uh, but there's a lot out there that don't have that sense of relationship, and particularly in the MBA. I don't know why it is. But I think, you know, we graduate our MBAs and they go out into the diaspora and they disappear. <laughs> and, uh, and you think, well, that's a, this is a group that you probably want to know. They probably have done pretty well in their careers and, you know, they probably have resources that, you know, we could tap to help support our programs. But we don't know who they are. We don't know where they live. You know, we don't know what they're doing. So we're using the MBA 50th as an opportunity to reconnect with the MBA class and to do this right. And I'm viewing it as a pilot program. If we, can, if we can figure out how to manage alumni relations better in this program, then we can extend it to all of our alumni groups, whether it's bachelors, accounting, marketing, finance, different master's programs, doctoral students, so that we can build that, rebuild that community. And, um, so we're, we're doing this MBA, and we've, uh, the Alumni Association and, and the uh, foundation have uh, allowed us access to the database. We're now uh, in the process of cleaning it up as much as we can. And then we're gonna invite the MBAs to come to a series of mini reunions this fall in uh, the usual places, you know, Oklahoma City and Tulsa, Dallas, Houston, Wichita, Stillwater, and maybe Kansas City. This is a new opportunity for us. And then the big event will be a gala celebration in April here on the Stillwater campus. And we like to see this maybe be one of the biggest reunions that's ever been done here. And uh, but it's not an event, it's, it's the beginning of a process, really, mm -hmm. to connect with uh, that audience to, and, and, and to create a dialogue with them that's not just one way where, you know, once or twice a year they get a newsletter and a request for a donation, that it's really more of a two-way conversation. And, you know, today we're blessed with, uh, you know, technology that can enable us to do that. Again, back to that kind of social, social media 
they can be talking to us, we can be talking to them, and they can be talking to each other. And uh, again, creating that community. Tagging on your comment about student reunion involving alumni and student recruitment, think about markets. Or have you had a chance to, to look at where your students are coming from, where you think you need to be? For example, there's been a lot of discussion about what we're doing in Texas, for right. example. Have you thought about your, your markets from that perspective? There's no question we're doing much more in Texas than ever before. I mean, I think the, I can't quote the exact statistics, but in talking to our uh, marketing communications folks and recruiting that uh, we're seeing a much bigger percentage of uh, Texans coming up now due to some adjustments we made where, uh, you know, if you have, if you've got the grades, mm -hmm. you can come here in essentially a tuition neutral mm -hmm. situation, you know, and, um, and, you know, we're not that far away from Texas. So there's a lot of good students down there that I think we can draw upon. And the fact of the matter is a lot, you know, a very large percentage of our graduates uh, do go to Texas for their employment. Um, I think, you know, we had a sense, and I don't want to, I can't be quoted on this, but we were looking at that alumni database for the MBA, and I'd say at least a third are in Texas. Sound about know. right. Sound about right. And um, so, you know, we're, we're active there. We're doing in, for instance, we're doing a, a nice event in Dallas um, in uh, the next month on entrepreneurship. One of our alumni there, uh, Joe Easton, who uh, owns ISN Networks, uh, has volunteered to sponsor that. And we're going to have uh, uh, Mike Morris from the School of Entrepreneurship, uh, myself down there. And we're also going to have uh, Dr. Robert Barron, who's a uh, uh, senior faculty member, chair professor we hired last year, who's just a one of the top authorities in entrepreneurship give a talk. Mm -hmm. So we expect a very good turnout in Dallas for this and uh, build up, continue to build those relationships. What excites you most about the Spirit School of Business? You touched on some of these things, but if you summarized it, and what, what, it, what it gives you the most uh, cause for excitement? I think, you know, it's, I think there's a readiness on the part of that whole community to do something great, um, you know, I, you know, you can you can go into an organization and you can say to yourself, you know, yeah, I'd like to take them over there, but they're only going to get over there kicking and screaming all the way, you know, it's that proverbial pushing a string up the hill. I don't think that's true at the Spear School. Now, I'm not saying that the things I've been talking to you about here are going to, you know, just fly through without any resistance at all. No, nothing ever works quite that way. No. But uh, I think on the other hand, you know, there's some degree of pent up energy that was looking for kind of, okay, what is the next move? You know, and I'm, you give me a good argument, and let me have a little input into that. I get behind that flag and, and, and march. And I, I think that, uh, I think we're ready to do that. Um, I'm just hopeful that, uh, you know, that the uh, economic conditions and the challenges that, we ex that exist in terms of state funding and so forth, I, I just hope they don't become worse because, um, you know, against the backdrop of these great things that we could be doing, even if they didn't cost anything to do, I think they're harder to accomplish when there's sort of a, a negative sentiment that's been created and people are sort of down in the dumps mentally. So, you know, I'm hoping that we can at least, you know, maintain at a reasonable level so that, you know, people maintain a positive attitude and then we can capitalize on that energy to move forward. What have been your greatest challenges uh, to date as Dean? Well, I think I told you about one of them and it's just, um, it's just a sea of people. Um, you know, the, um, it's like drinking water through a fire hose, you know. I, honestly, I'd, I'd only been in Oklahoma one time in my life before I took the job. I know none of the players. You know, I didn't even know who the governor was, you know, uh, senators. You know, 
you know, and then you begin to, to meet the alumni. And of course, it's an alumni are here, and they're also in Texas and other places. And uh, it's a sea of faces. And you know, you like to give my the way my dad brought me up. And in fact, he was a salesperson. He was always, you know, you got to know people by their first name. You know, and I go, <laughs> we're talking cast of thousands here. <laughs> and uh, you know, and then then you go over to the school, and uh, of course, you got a hundred faculty. And I was told I had a hundred staff, but then that's kind of a, a little bit of a misconception because we have a lot of student workers. So the staff size, if you do a head count, is actually five hundred, not a hundred. And uh, and that was the summer, and then the students arrive, you know, and <laughs> four thousand, you know, undergraduates descend upon you, you know, and eight hundred graduate students. So I'm doing my best to, you know connect some names with faces, but it's, it's a bit of a challenge. The other thing that's different, I think, is the dean's job is a, um, it's a, definitely a seven by 24 job. Um, it, uh, and I'm not, you know, that's not totally different than what I was doing before, because those involve long hours too, but it's, it's the type of job where, you know, you have sort of appointments on the half hour. And uh, good description. You know, you have you're going from one thing to the next, and where you'd like to really delve in and dig down, because that's that's my nature, and it's the nature of somebody with a PhD. You'd like to delve and understand. You know, you really don't have that opportunity. You just kind of got to go with your best judgment and move on. Otherwise, you'd <laughs> you'd lock everything up, bottleneck it. So that that's interesting. We talked about this earlier, but when about President Hargis. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about his leadership contributions to OSU and the Spirit School? Well, I mean, he's one of your graduates. Now. He's he's a county graduate. Well, it's a little of an odd situation. As I, I I always remind him that uh, he's also while I work for Burns, he's also on our faculty, so he works for me too. <laughs> um, he's. Uh, Officially in our uh, economics and legal studies department, mm -hmm. so he's on the roster. And you see his picture there, you know. And I mentioned that to him, and I told him that I thought his teaching load was a little low, <laughs> but he said he wanted to talk to me about his salary. So <laughs> maybe I won't go there. Uh, the uh, yeah, Burns has been. I think maybe because I was his kind of his first. Of certainly his first dean hire, I, I think that, uh, you know, we've had a really good working relationship off the bat. And, um, you know, he's taken an interest, I think, in what we're trying to do and how we're trying to produce change. Uh, he's look, looking at what we're doing and opportunities to maybe extend some of that into the university as a whole. Um, so I feel really good about that. And he's also, you know, we do a lot of... Uh, big events in Tulsa and Oklahoma City and he's always willing calendar permitting to come over and do a keynote or to host a panel or to be present and, and, and you know available uh, which is great and um, now we have a new uh, provost in uh, Robert Sternberg who I'm equally excited about uh, and I think that uh, you know Given his focus on, I mean, his career focus on creativity, and his personality, which is another another fellow with a great sense of humor, um, and his energy that he brought from Tufts and Yale, uh, you know, I think we're I think we're really well poised here at Oklahoma State. I think that stars are aligned to really do something great, and uh, you know, it's an exciting time okay. to be here. Let me, let me finish this one question, and then you get on your half-hour meeting. Okay. I appreciate you giving me more no than problem. half hours. No problem. No problem. This is important. <laughs> well, uh, you know, fast forward in five, ten years yeah. you know, down the road, uh, how do you hope Spirit School of Business will be different? I mean, can, can, you, can you describe If you looked at it ten years now, can you describe it to me how you'd hope it'd be? Yeah, I think that um, some of the some of the dimensions uh, I've, I've alluded to, but. You know, I think that there's uh, the reputation factor um, that, you know, we will be known more broadly than we are today, um, you know, not just within the boundaries of Oklahoma, but the nation and internationally. I, I think that we will continue the trend toward um, becoming more of a borderless 
activity. Uh, in other words, that uh, we'll have students around the globe uh, taking our courses and participating in our programs uh, who will maybe periodically visit campus, but not that often. Um, I think you'll see that the Spears School in that period of time will have some uh, uh, facilities on the ground in other countries, um, uh, possibly in cooperation with other with foreign universities, and we already have a lot of those relationships. Um, but I'm talking about more. We'll actually have our shingle out, and uh, we're seeing. Uh, a possible pathway to doing that uh, with uh, local venture capital that uh, there are um, business people in other countries who are lamenting the lack of management education and they feel the fastest way they could get there would be if you know they were to provide the seed funds to put Spear School on the ground to graduate people locally who can then go and populate those companies and take leadership positions in those uh, industries. So I think, you know, I think you'll see more of that from us. We're not the only ones that are doing this, you know, the uh, many of uh, Duke University and others are doing that, uh, but no reason we can't be too, and it's part of our internationalization. I think you're going to also see um, technology just getting better and better to support this kind of thing. Uh, we meet meeting, after, I know my next meeting is with the president of Monterey Tech coming up from Mexico. That's where I'm going after you. And uh, we already have a good relationship with them, but you know, I'm seeing the potential in a very short period of time that we'll be able to more fully integrate our classrooms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll be running a course in Stillwater or Tulsa and it'll be simultaneously running in, uh, you know, Monterey, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's a good pilot there for us to then take that and extend it, heading south on the same time zone into Latin America, mm -hmm. but also to broaden to some of the places where we have a foothold, like in uh, Vietnam, in uh -huh. Kenya, Thailand, uh, India. Uh, and I think, you know, Maybe this is a little bit of you know the legacy of Dr. Bennett. Maybe going to those places where the other guys aren't going. I mean, you know, everybody's very popular. We want to be in France, we want to be in Italy, we want to be in China. We want to be in those places too. But to be in those next wave countries, you know, um, Indonesia, uh, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, where you know we can really make a difference in, in creating a infrastructure for management education in those places. Larry, what have we not covered we should have? I think we covered a lot of ground here.